Welcome to the 700 Club. Undermining the Israeli government, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu leveled that charge at Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer after Schumer called for new leadership in Israel. Schumer claimed that Netanyahu is an obstacle to peace who bows to the demands of right-wing extremists. Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem. Speaking from the Senate floor Thursday, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has lost his way and called for a change in Israel's government. By allowing his political survival to take the precedence over the best interests of Israel. The Netanyahu coalition no longer fits the needs of Israel after October 7th. The world has changed radically since then. Schumer's speech comes as a growing number of Democrats are urging the Biden administration to step up public pressure on Israel to halt its war on Hamas. Schumer charges Netanyahu's coalition consists of far-right extremists who have been too willing to tolerate the toll of the war on civilians in Gaza. Israel cannot survive if it becomes a pariah. Netanyahu responded in a statement saying, Israel expects Schumer to refrain from undermining the Israeli government. Israel's ambassador to the U.S., Michael Herzog, wrote on X, Israel is a sovereign democracy. It is unhelpful, all the more so as Israel is at war against the genocidal terror organization Hamas to comment on the political scene of a democratic ally. Former Israeli Prime Minister Niftali Bennett said, we are an independent nation, not a banana republic. Israeli opposition leader Yair Lapid criticized Netanyahu, calling Schumer's speech proof that one by one Netanyahu is losing Israel's biggest supporters in the U.S. Schumer's speech is especially surprising because of his past support for Netanyahu. In 2015, he was one of a few Democrats who voted against President Barack Obama's Iran deal and didn't speak out against Netanyahu for his speech to Congress criticizing the deal. Moments after Schumer spoke, congressional Republican leaders slammed his comments. It's just plain wrong for an American leader to play such a divisive role in Israeli politics while our closest ally in the region is in an existential battle for its very survival. The Jewish state of Israel deserves an ally that acts like one. Israel is not a colony of America whose leaders serve at the pleasure of the party in power in Washington. Senator Lindsey Graham called it earth-shattering bad and said to Schumer, you've done a lot of damage, my friend, and you need to fix this. In a more measured tone, Democratic Senator Ben Cardin said, as allies and friends, we must support the Israeli people in their efforts to shape their own destiny and chart the course of their post-war nation. In the meantime, the military campaign to defeat Hamas hinges on Israel entering Rafah, the last stronghold of the terrorist group in Gaza. Despite enormous pressure from the U.S. and other nations, Netanyahu pledges Israel will go on. I will continue to repel the pressures and we will enter Rafah. We will complete the elimination of the remaining Hamas battalions and we will restore security and bring absolute victory to the people of Israel and the state of Israel. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Well, David Friedman is the former U.S. ambassador to Israel. He joins us now from Jerusalem. So, Ambassador, tell us your reaction. What's your reaction to all of this? Well, Gordon, thanks, and it's great to be with you. I, look, I think this was a very dark day, maybe historically dark day, in the history of the relationship between the United States and Israel. Um, it was a gut punch that uh, Schumer leveled against Israel. Look, um, Benjamin Netanyahu is a political figure, and, you know, there'll be an election, you know, one of these days, and, you know, he'll win or he'll lose, or maybe he won't run. That's all, you know, down the road. Right now, the people of Israel um, are standing with Benjamin Netanyahu because he's their leader in a time of war, and Schumer knows that. And to try to um, divide Israel, you know, uh, at this time, when they're facing this existential battle where they're on the cusp of finally defeating this implacable foe in Hamas— is, as I think I agree with Lindsey Graham, I mean, Schumer did an enormous amount of damage. And, and, and you know what the crazy thing is, you know, 
They want a ceasefire. They want a hostage deal. What Schumer did made it very unlikely that they will get either, because as Hamas sees America moving away from Israel, Hamas has no reason to compromise. They think they're going to win this war. And that's a terrible signal that Schumer sent to the uh, into the Middle East. Well, that's my my main complaint against it is that if if you're on the other side, if you're the terrorist sitting in a tunnel, you, you literally are saying, all I have to do now is wait. And if I wait yeah. long enough, I'm going to win. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, the point that Schumer made is if Israel doesn't follow America's uh, military directives, uh, America is going to abandon Israel. America is going to use its leverage, its 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 uh, treasury, its uh, its money, its weaponry. It's it's going to withhold all that from Israel until Israel, you know, cows to the uh, to the sovereign. You know, that's that's what the Shumar is saying. And so this is music to Hamas's ears. And by the way, it ought to terrify everybody because if Hamas, you know, is is not eliminated, if Hamas survives this war intact, even with a couple of battalions. That's a template for terrorists all around the world to commit atrocities, to take hostages, and then to bargain for victory as the United States, you know, uh, softens on 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 fighting. You, you saw yesterday that you know we just gave another ten billion dollars to Iran in the middle of this war. We're we're funding Iran with massive amounts of money. You know the policies here are maddening, and um, and and I just wish we could we could turn this around. Well, it seems like history is repeating again and again here that, you know, there's uh, these outbursts of terrorist attacks, and then suddenly everybody wants to start talking peace and, and forcing Israel into a, a peace settlement, peace negotiations. It just seems to to be a reward for terrorism. Not just to uh, a peace negotiation, but to uh, unilaterally uh, impose upon Israel a Palestinian state. I mean, can you imagine? You have 80% of the Palestinians in Judea and Samaria that celebrated the October 7th attacks. Don't just support them, but celebrated them. And now, uh, as as the outcome, we're going to give these people a platform to continue to uh, continue their efforts to destroy Israel. I mean, it's completely upside down. And and I think you know one other point, which I think people need to understand. You know, Netanyahu. Uh, really does have the support of the Israeli people as a war leader. You know, whether they like him as a politician or not, this is not going to weaken Netanyahu. This is going to weaken America. It's actually going to do exactly the opposite of what Schumer is trying to accomplish. Well, I liken Netanyahu to uh, Winston Churchill. Uh, he was the prime minister in wartime, and then after the war, uh, he, they, they voted him out. So, you know, we'll see what happens. I'm not making a, any predictions here. I do want to talk about what you just said about 80 percent, because I think a lot of people don't get, don't get this. I'm going to quote the Palestinian Center for Policy Survey and Research. They put out a survey December 13th, 23. Now, uh, I hear that the Palestinian Center is actually, they're, they're not cooking the books. They're not making up numbers like the uh, Ministry of Health in Gaza, but uh, they are saying 52% of Gazans, this is after October 7th, 85% of West Bank um, respondents, so this would be 72% of Palestinians overall, are voicing satisfaction with how Hamas is conducting the war, satisfaction with October 7th. Uh, do you think anyone in the current administration understands they're they're actually rejoicing over October seventh and and they want Hamas to lead them? Yeah, I think they may know that, but I don't think they care. I think what they care about are you know a hundred thousand voters in Dearborn, Michigan, or maybe in Minnesota or someplace else that in a tough swing state have the capacity to alter the outcome of the election. That's all this is about. None of this is about getting to the right outcome. In uh, in Israel, the right outcome in Israel, uh, I think everybody would have to agree that has you know a working brain is to defeat Hamas. Um, with if you don't defeat Hamas, they're going to come back. They've said they'll come back and slaughter Jews. So I mean that's the right outcome. After that, we can talk about how to rebuild and how to restructure. But you have to defeat them after this war. That's not what uh, Biden and Schumer are talking about. What they're talking about is is finding a way to thread a needle. On the one hand, they say you know we love Israel. And, and maybe that placates the democratic 
Jewish voters, you know, who, who support Israel. On the other hand, they say, we're going to cut off the resources for Netanyahu, and somehow that's going to placate the far, you know, left, woke, you know, Palestinian Arab communities throughout the country that, that are small in number, but do have in certain swing states some real influence. So they're trying to play it both ways. My prediction is they're offending everybody and that Trump's going to win in a landslide. But that's, that's you know, we won't know that for nine months. But right now, what Schumer and Biden are doing is all about politics. They couldn't care less about what the outcome will be in Israel. That's not their concern right now. Were you surprised that it was Schumer that did this? It was so disappointing, you know, because, look, I, you know, I grew up in New York. Um, I've known him for a very long time. Uh, I've always considered him to be a, a political animal. You know, they say the most dangerous place in the world is between Chuck Schumer and a camera. You know, so I, I've, I've always known that politics was his was his God, if you will. But um, but I didn't know that he would go this far. I mean, to to undermine Israel at a time of war when they're fighting for their lives is an absolute low point in the uh, in the relationship between the United States Senate and the state of Israel. And he's and he's parroting the uh, Biden as well. He cleared this with Biden before he gave the speech. So it's it's deeply troubling and disappointing. And um, and I think ultimately um, there, there will there will, be, there will be a price that he has to pay. I think people will ultimately reject what he's done. And his I don't think history will be kind to Chuck Schumer. Let's talk about Benny Gantz and his visit to Washington. Do you think that had any role to play in this? Uh, he's obviously popular in Israel today, but uh, I, I was surprised he, he, he went to Washington, D.C. It just it didn't make sense in, in a time of war to do it. Um, any it influence from that trip? No, I mean, look, I, you know, I, I know him well, and, I, and I'll give him the benefit of the doubt that he thought the relationship was going sideways and he thought maybe he could help. He clearly didn't help. And, and I think the reason he didn't help is because uh, the Schumer-Biden uh, crowd wasn't interested in repairing the relationship. What they were interesting, interested in doing was in punishing Netanyahu and, and using that for political purposes. So even if Benny Gantz went there with good intentions, and I'm, I'm willing to assume he did, um, his efforts failed because they didn't resonate with the Democratic leadership that's looking simply to, to placate their uh, their Palestinian you know far left radical base. Uh, final question: Any advice for the Christian community uh, here in the United States and around the world? Uh, what to do at this point in time to help Israel? Well, look, I, I, I think the uh, the Christian community in America is, uh, is is they're they're large, deeply faithful, incredible friends of Israel, and of course I would I would say first of course they should pray for Israel. But on top of that, look, um, the Christians have political clout in this country that, that Jews don't. And um, to the extent that, you know, the message can come from the Christian community that we, we support the state of Israel, we stand with Israel, we're committed to Israel's survival, we're committed to Israel defeating its enemies. We don't wish harm on anyone, but Israel has to win this war and defeat these, these evil forces. I think it goes a long way. And, and, and obviously, um, we have right now in our uh, in our government people that are that are, are not of that mind. All right, we will we will keep standing with Israel. Ambassador David Friedman, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. God bless you. A new milestone in presidential politics. For the first time in history, a vice president campaigned from an abortion clinic. It's all part of the Biden administration's reproductive rights tour. As medical reporter Lori Johnson reports, the move could backfire. Calling it a health care clinic, Vice President Kamala Harris campaigned at a Minnesota Planned Parenthood facility where abortions are performed. She used it as an opportunity to slam lawmakers in other states who voted to limit abortion. How dare these elected leaders believe they are in a better position to tell women what they need, to tell women what is in their best interest. More than 20 states have passed laws banning or limiting access to abortion since the Supreme Court struck down Roe versus Wade. In six states, voters have approved ballot referendums protecting abortion. More are expected in November. We may see more campaign appearances at abortion clinics as the Biden administration appears to consider this issue as a way to drive his supporters to the polls.
Democrats are going to talk about abortion access as a key plank in this election. Uh, it motivates Democratic voters, and it could help with independent voters. It's part of what the administration has dubbed its reproductive freedom tour. Some say the strategy could backfire. Polling shows that even pro-choice Democrats, though, do not um, approve of the extreme agenda that the Biden-Harris administration has, which is abortion up until uh, way later in pregnancy, up until the moment of birth, really. Um, also, that our taxpayers would pay, our tax dollars would pay for that. With so many challenges facing the country, voters may resent the fact that the Biden administration chose to go to an abortion center, not to our heavily compromised southern border, not to a grocery store where people can barely afford food, but to a place where children are killed on purpose. That's what they care about, Students for Life told CBN News. I honestly think it's just heartbreaking to, to see the Vice President of the United States celebrating a clinic whose purpose is to take unborn lives. Rather than doing something concrete to help women who are facing these situations. Regent Law Professor Aaron Hawley says many Americans would rather see the Biden administration help women keep their babies. So instead of working to facilitate programs that help the unborn, that help mothers like pregnancy care centers do throughout this country, um, instead that they're celebrating uh, organizations that profit off of a baby's demise. Indeed, Harris's abortion clinic visit energizes pro-life voters. No other presidential administration has been as focused on promoting abortion as this one, the National Right to Life Committee said in a statement. And Americans United for Life said, we've seen pro-abortion politicians becoming increasingly brazen about their support for abortion. Kamala Harris's visit is about as bad as it gets. So while this is the first time a president or vice president campaigned at an abortion center, it may prove to have been a step too far. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Well, Charlene was getting exercised <laughs> while that story was going. Wow. What, what's your reaction to it? I, it's, it's grieving and it's disheartening to see a vice president go to campaign an abortion clinic. I mean, with everything else, just like Kristen Hawkins said in that story, with everything else that's happening at the southern border, there's the issue with grocery prices. I think most Americans, if you were to do a poll, what are they most concerned about? They can't afford groceries. They can't afford to put gas in their car. And yet you would make this the issue. I think it's going to backfire. I really, I think people are either going to... Uh, well, they've had some election success with the issue. Yeah, but I think, I think younger people, younger voters, first of all, they wanted a younger candidate than Biden anyway, but I think younger people are looking at the pro-life issue and like, I, I'm more inclined to vote pro-life. Yeah. The surveys are, are, are pretty yeah. clear that, yeah. yes, there should yeah. be limits. Yeah. And, and it, you know, the debate is, is it 12 weeks? Is it 16 yeah. weeks? Is it 15 weeks? What, what's the time? T time? I'll go back to 2016 and, and a presidential debate Hillary Clinton made the statement that she supported abortion up to the, yeah. the day of birth. And, and uh, I, I was shocked that she did it. And I said, you just lost the election. It, you, you, can't, you, you can't have that as, as some kind of winning issue. Well, we'll see on this one. And there, the, the, obviously, the politics is going to get fast and furious right here Absolutely. in America. It's, it's still March, and we don't vote till November, but uh, stay informed, get educated on, on what the positions are, and, and make up your own mind. And pray. And pray. <laughs> and pray, definitely. From Obi-Wan Kenobi to Willy Wonka and most everyone in between, James Arnold Taylor was a master of hundreds of voices. Then he was silenced. Doctor's orders. He had to stop speaking. That's when a man who played so many other characters had to find out who he really was. For over two decades, James Arnold Taylor has been the voice of many beloved characters, including one of his favorites. Hello there. Obi-Wan Kenobi in the animated Star Wars series. I knew ever since I was a little kid, I wanted to do voices in cartoons. And I was very much pursuing that. And I had some opportunities to match celebrities. And so some of my first work was uh, doing voice doubling for people like Michael J. Fox and uh, 
Well, wait a second, Doc. Whoa, this is heavy. And, uh, and Christopher Lloyd, great Scott Marty. I started doubling people and then got the attention of agents and stuff and was able to get into a, a full-time career as a voice actor. James' career soon took off, and he achieved his dream of voicing cartoons. In a world where one man does all the voices. Totally awesome. Yampa dampa do. I was the voice of, you know, everything from Obi-Wan Kenobi in Star Wars, Fred Flintstone at the time, Leonardo the Ninja Turtle, this video game series, Ratchet and Clank. And I was in full bore in those productions being done right then. And I woke up one day and I had no voice. The Taylors discovered black mold in their new home went to the doctor, got some blood tests, and realized there were six different types of mold in my bloodstream, and one of them being black mold, stachybotrys, which is the very dangerous one. And I had been, you know, having um, everything from brain fog, memory loss, all these things, but particularly that my voice was going. So I remember very vividly on that day, it was February 13th, 2005, and I went and uh, just got back from the doctor, and he says, you gotta stop speaking. And I said, God, please don't let this be the worst day of my life. James and his wife felt overwhelmed and relied on their faith to carry them through. We were in the process of adopting our daughter at the time. So we've got this house with this black mold. We're in a lawsuit with people with the house. We're adopting a child from China and I can't speak and I'm a successful voice actor. So those couple months in, we were like going, wow, this is, I don't know if it can get much worse than that. And so we were really just on our knees every day. The Taylors trusted God as James began extensive therapy to regain his voice. I was going to doctors and they all wanted to put me on various medications, uh, some indefinitely, and they said that my voice would probably not be the same, it, you know, it'd be less than. So I took a very proactive approach and a, a holistic approach too. Changed everything about my diet, my exercise, the way I lived. Uh, went on a whole foods diet and just really uh, did the best I could to cleanse my system of the mold. I had this wonderful gift that God gave me since I was a child to do these voices and to mimic them, but I wasn't doing it right. And he needed to correct that. And he needed to correct it through something that was shocking to my system in every possible way. But I learned and retrained my voice to be even stronger than it was before. The Taylors eventually moved out of their house. As they completed the adoption for their new daughter, James was going through the paperwork when something caught his eye. I see her birthday is February 13th, 2005. So the day that I thought was the worst day of my life, God made the best day of my life. He turned it around. And what he showed me is that he's always listening. And the, the things that we think are our hardest journeys are there to build us up for the next journey and to make us stronger for the next, the next hurdle that's gonna come up in life. I've worked in Star Wars. I've worked in some of the biggest movie franchises. I've worked with some of the biggest names in Hollywood. And yet, I'm so grateful that I get to wake up in a normal home with a wife and a daughter that love me and a peace that cannot come from any of the stuff I get from my work, but can only come from the love of Christ and family and um, just true love. Fully relying on God has inspired James to make a film. I've had a passion uh, for storytelling and I love the parable of the prodigal son. So I recently wrote a movie called Hidden Blessings about a painter that's kind of a reclusive painter and a documentary film crew comes in to document his life and they stumble across the story of the prodigal son in the process of it. James is thankful God restored his voice and enjoys using it to share the love of Jesus. I'm a high school dropout. I came from a very broken home and I've been blessed with this amazing career. And then he gave me the gifts to be able to share that with people. And so I've always been very open about my faith in my career. I've tried to be a light in a dark place in Hollywood and such as well, and just be open. I love Jesus. Jesus saved my life. So I'm gonna say it. I'll say it in whatever voice you want me to say it in. What an incredible, amazing story. And the fact that his voice is now stronger and better than before is just a testimony of the faithfulness and the goodness of God. And isn't it amazing that sometimes the journey that we take takes a turn that we weren't expecting, but God was right there. He met him there. He had to trust God in that storm, but God is faithful to bring us through when we trust him. The Bible says that they that put their trust 
in the Lord will never be put to shame. What an inspiring, amazing testimony of God's faithfulness. Praise God. Welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN news break. Several Midwestern states are dealing with widespread damage after tornadoes ripped through the region. In Ohio, at least two people died when a twister a half mile wide destroyed a mobile home community and other buildings. In Indiana, there are a number of injuries and fears of fatalities after powerful winds hit the city of Winchester as well as Jefferson County. Next door in Kentucky, storms damaged at least 50 buildings including some homes. CBN's Operation Blessing is giving underprivileged children in the Honduras access to education and spiritual growth. The rural community of Nueva Union has been blessed with a new school. The school is equipped with desks, learning materials, and two bathrooms. In San Antonio, El Mirador, the ministry provided construction and educational materials to renovate an old school building. Operation Blessing teams also conducted hygiene trainings and shared the gospel through CBN Superbook events. Through these outreaches, Operation Blessing is making lasting impact on Latin American communities. You can learn more about what Operation Blessing is doing by visiting ob.org. Well, this weekend, people will decorate with shamrocks, and some of them, like me, will wear green in honor of St. Patrick. He's a man who was once tortured for his faith before spreading it across all of Ireland. It's an epic story told in CBN's docudrama, I Am Patrick. Take a look. The real man, the real St. Patrick, is far more fascinating than the legend and myth. Mark Adifa. 84 sad. details, take one, Mark. They wanted to tap into the human element Patrick's humanity as much as possible and the struggle that he has, the conflict between Patrick, the man of God, and Patrick, the man. On one hand, Patrick believes that he's come here to spread God's message, but on the other hand, he's facing some very real and dangerous obstacles. Would that I had the courage to be like Patrick. Every time you come and look, at that extraordinary life of his, you learn something else. You get more of the feel of the man. He's obviously a great model and example to Christians everywhere. He's a great model for Christians everywhere. He was a model for me. I got a copy of his uh, autobiography, I Am Patrick, uh, Ego Patricius, um, about 30 years ago. And what a great inspiration, uh, how he persevered and, and literally brought Christianity to Ireland and then preserved Christianity for Europe after the Dark Ages. It's a wonderful story. You can watch I Am Patrick for your gift of any dollar amount. You can go to IamPatrick.com. You can call us, 1-800-700-7000. Or you can text the word Patrick to 71777. We'll send you a DVD copy, but you'll also get instant 4K streaming access to watch it. You can watch it on any smart TV, on a computer, any of these portable devices. You can watch it through the CBN Family app. Do it now. Um, get informed about what this day, St. Patrick's Day, means. And the real story, based on his autobiography, based on the real history of what he did to change a nation. Kenya and her family barely escaped with their lives. A major hurricane slammed into their home. They managed to get out just in the nick of time. The family is thankful that God helped them survive the night, and they're grateful that you helped them get through the difficult days that follow. Category 5 Hurricane Otis was a nightmare that ripped through the communities of Acapulco, Mexico. Eight-year-old Kenya remembers what happened to her that night. We were wet. And I thought the wind was going to blow us away. It pushed and pulled us and we could not stand up. We had nothing to eat and everything was destroyed. Kenya's mom, Pilar, said they barely escaped with their lives. The minute we left our house, it collapsed. We went to my neighbor's house to take refuge. I thank God for all Basics like food and clean water were scarce. During the crisis, Operation Blessing's disaster relief team was on hand. 
We worked with Pastor Morales to provide emergency food, clean water, and milk. For them, a can of milk is a blessing because they can prepare a glass of milk with some bread. And to help kids with the emotional trauma caused by the hurricane, we showed episodes of CBN's Superbook in nine different communities, including Kenya's. She said she watched the story of Daniel and learned how he trusted God during scary situations. I learned to pray, Lord, I ask you to take care of me and my family to take care of all of us. After watching the Daniel episode, Kenya told us she prayed to become a Christian. I closed my eyes and prayed, Lord, I ask you to come into my heart. Thanks to CBN partners, 200 children prayed to become Christians after watching Superbook episodes like Kenya. Thank you, because you have supported us. We can move forward. If you're a member of the 700 Club, that thank you goes to you. And that's you in action, not just here in the United States, but around the world. When disasters strike, we want to strike back with love and compassion. And here's someone who survived a hurricane in Mexico, the families in desperate need. And you were there for them in their time of need. So thank you. Thank you for what you're doing for people around the world. If you're not a member, I encourage you to join with us. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call us, 1-800-700-7000. You can also go to CBN.com. There's a place where you can have a giving page. And if you give monthly on the Internet, you automatically sign up for what I call Pledge Express, where it's electronic monthly giving, bank doing all the work, and we send as our gift to you Power for Life monthly teaching CDs. So how much is it to join? Well, it's just $20 a month, 65 cents a day. Some of you can join at higher levels, and we have them. 700 Club Gold, $40 a month. 1,000 Club, $1,000 a year. That's $84 a month. Any way you want to do it, any level you want to do it, call us now. 1-800-700-7000. Charlie? When Amber Lavengood arrived at the scene of a horrific accident, she saw a car lying upside down, debris everywhere, and her son's body on the ground. As an ER nurse, she immediately thought there is no way anyone could survive this crash. He said, Mom, I can't breathe. And I said, wow. He said, the car flipped. And I said, where are you? And he said he didn't know. August 19th, 2021, Amber Lavengood got the phone call every parent fears. Her son Jaden had been driving with friends in rural Indiana when the driver lost control, flipping the car end over end several times. His mom Amber had been an emergency room nurse and knows how deadly a crash like that can be. I was instantly worst case scenario, expecting some you know, major chest trauma. And knowing that the force of any kind of a car flip is enough alone to kill a person. Jaden was able to get himself and another passenger out of the car. Dazed and injured, he called his mom. A bystander took his phone and told Amber where they were. As she raced to the scene, Amber called her mother for prayer, then cried out to God. There's a medic on the way. Can I get there first? All those thoughts are just racing. Um, cry out to God, not my baby, please. I needed God right then. I needed to be in conversation with him and to know that he was with me and with my son. I couldn't be with Jaden at that exact second, and I had to find where he was, but I knew God could, and God could provide him with the first responders and the medical attention until I got there, or um, God could sustain him. Several EMTs went to church with Amber and quickly started a prayer chain for the boy's survival. Still, when she arrived on the scene, Amber was overwhelmed at the devastation. The car was worse than I could imagine. The sight was just unbelievable. Um, the car was laying upside down. There was debris everywhere. And um, my son was laying on the edge of the hill with another gentleman. And you could see that there was someone stuck in the car. The nurse in me instantly thinks, there's no way these boys are gonna live through this. My mind was racing with all these possible injuries. And I know that a chest contusion blunt force injury to the chest can be fatal. So that was a battle um, to just lay hands on him and pray and not be able to pick him up and hold him. Um, that was very, that was very hard. Jaden and another boy were taken by ambulance to a local hospital. The driver was life flighted to a trauma hospital in Indianapolis. Despite the grim reality of the situation, Amber felt God was with them. I was at peace. 
I was able to be in the moment with my son um, and also know that my, you know, my other children were being prayed for and provided for. Um, and I knew that and trusted that God was working out all the details, even the ones I couldn't see. And no matter what um, was to happen, you know, I trusted God's will. Jaden had a concussion, but was conscious in talking. He had deep bruising across his chest, and his arm appeared deformed and possibly broken. Somehow, he believed, he had already been healed. Jaden, at that time, was kept saying that, you know, he was not going to have any broken bones, that, you know, he had prayed and asked Jesus, and Jesus had healed him. And he kept saying over and over again, you know, my Jesus saves, I'm not going to have any broken bones. And obviously, as a Christian mom, I'm like, oh, yes, that's great. <laughs> um, and the nurse in me is expecting, you know, he's got a broken neck, possibly broken back. He's got chest contusions. It looked like internal bleeding, especially around where the liver was located. Medical staff gave Jaden an EKG to check the rhythm of his heart and an ultrasound looking for internal bleeding. X-rays then followed, checking for fractured vertebrae and broken bones. Amber waited and prayed. To everyone's amazement, all the tests revealed Jaden was fine. It is very amazing. Um, it was amazing to witness um, and even more amazing to come home with your son that night and know that he walked away. Oh, it was crazy. Like I was really thanking God and I was really happy. And I, I felt great in like a week, but my body, I could move again. It was just my, I had a little head problems, but I just prayed about it and I felt great. I was ready to go back to school in like two weeks. From a medical standpoint, I can't give you any explanation as to why he didn't have any broken bones. Um, to have a mild to moderate concussion only is really miraculous. Jaden knew that it was the grace of God that brought him through his near brush with death. Uh, I remember in the hospital, I was like really thankful because I thought like, I should have been dead. Like after I got out of the car and I was slowly like going out of it, I was like, I should be dead. The other boys also survived and began their road to recovery. In the midst of what could have been a life ending accident, Amber is thankful for the prayers from her community and the grace of God that sustained them. Surrounding yourself with a good church family and a good prayer family that's going to support you in your hour of need made a huge difference. God is good always. His plan, we don't always understand, and I can't lean on my understanding. But in this situation, I did give God all the praise immediately. It was ex I mean, I was ecstatic. I was un in disbelief at how amazing the outcome was. The accident could have been very different. Very different. And God deserves that glory. Jaden says the accident helped shape his faith, something that's evident to his family and friends. I'll sit here and pray, and they're like, you're not the same person. I'm like, no, I am not the same person. I'm a different person. The biggest thing is the power of prayer and just to believe in God because he does have a plan for you. And he does give you strength, too. It is true. By the grace and the mercy of God. I mean, we all saw the picture that his mom held up of the car, how bad that looked. And yet he walks away without any broken bones. No one could do that except God. That is truly a miracle from God. It looked hopeless. It looked bad. But God was working out the details behind the scenes. And that's what he does. He works in our lives, even when it feels or looks like he's not working, he's working behind the scenes. And that's why we share these testimonies with you to encourage you to trust in God. And we are going to pray. Gordon and I are going to pray. But before we do, we have some amazing testimonies that we want to share with you. We have one from Carolyn by email. She says, I was diagnosed with bronchitis and I was coughing so much it hurt my chest and side. I went through three boxes of Kleenex expelling the, the plagum um, that was coming out of my body. I was given treatment and steroids, but nothing really worked. I was watching the 700 Club when Gordon prayed for the person who has productive coughing. He said, God is healing you now. I felt the presence of God immediately and began to give God praises. I am thankful because God healed me of my terrible coughing. Amen. Here's an answer to prayer. Mary could not breathe through her right nostril. This condition affected her for 23 years, afflicted her for 23 years. Watching this show, Terry said, someone else, you have an issue with the bone structure in your sinus cavity. You're being healed in Jesus' name with, with great 
joy. Mary jumped up and said, that's me. Thank you, God. She happily reports that she can now breathe through both nostrils. That is awesome. <laughs> this uh, 23 years of a blockage gone in an instant. I'll just ask you what that young man said. If, if you've ever had that near-death experience, when you walk away from it, realizing that God has touched you and has healed you, you are never the same again. He has encounters with people, and heaven invades earth. When he does, miracles happen. He is the Messiah, the anointed one, the one who was chosen to save people and to heal people. The signs of the Messiah are so clear. He gives life to the dead. He gives sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf. He enables the lame to walk again, run like deer. He does all of these things. Why? Because he loves you. So let's just walk into that love because faith works by love. When you understand how much he loves you, how much he cares for you, how he numbers every single hair on your head, how, he, how he's looking after you, guiding you, protecting you. When you understand all of those things, faith gets very easy. So let's look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Let's ask him to increase our faith so we can walk into that realm where he is and receive a miracle. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we come to you. We come to you believing. We believe in your sacrifice. We believe in your death for us. We believe in your resurrection. We believe that right now you ever live to give intercession for us. So, Lord, here is our need. Here is what we need to have happen that we can't do on our own. We ask now that you would heal us, that you would provide for us, that you would be our Savior, that you would be our all in all. Lord God, come invade us now, be with us now, for we ask it in Jesus' name. There's someone, you've got a similar in injury. I don't think it's from an accident, but there's a, uh, just a pressure on your uh, chest. It's very difficult for you to breathe. God is healing you. He just opened that up for you right now. Take that deep breath. God is healing you, restoring you now in Jesus' name. Charlotte? And the Lord is healing someone with problems uh, with the heel of your feet. It's been very painful to walk. And the Lord is saying, just begin to walk right now. Even as you're walking, healing is going to take place in the name of Jesus. He said, just walk right now because he is healing you. He's removing that pain. It's been painful for weeks, but the Lord says you are healed now. There's another person with a rash on your back. The Lord is removing that rash. It's been itching. It's been almost to the point of pus coming out, but the Lord says he is healing you right now in the name of Jesus. Thank I don't you, know if this Lord. is a related word to what Charlene just shared, but I, I, heard, I heard bone spurs calcium deposits. God is taking all of that away. He's making it normal again. No more pain, no more discomfort. Be healed now in Jesus' name. And even fevers, Lord is uh, causing fevers to just be gone right now in the name of Jesus. He is healing children of fevers specifically right now. Fevers, high fevers have had parents up at night. And the Lord is saying he is healing your children right now of fevers in Jesus' name. Someone with paralyzing uh, headaches, uh, you can't go outside, you have to sit in dark rooms. God, God is healing you and he's restoring everything. You don't have to live in fear anymore. And, and in the name of Jesus, may that pain leave you right now yes. and be restored. Thank you, Lord. Someone else, you've got problems with your sinus cavity and, and with breathing uh, through your nose. God is, is healing all of that for you. He's clearing out pathways, airways right now in the name of Jesus. Be healed Lord. and be made whole. Thank you, Lord. Even scoliosis is being healed right now. The Lord says, I am the Lord who healeth thee. I love you and I am healing. You have cried out. Say, Lord, I know you can do it. So Lord says he is crying. He's calling your name right now. He says, be healed. Scoliosis, be healed 
in the name of Jesus Christ. It's nothing for God to do this. This is easy for him, he says. He says, and I am doing it. Yes, scoliosis is being healed. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And amen. Nothing is too small for God. Nothing is too big. And if you need prayer, we're here for you. And we want to pray for you, with you. It's our honor, our privilege to do that. So call us, 1-800-700-7000. Here's a word from Leviticus. I broke the yoke of slavery from your neck so you can walk with your heads held high. God bless you. Have a wonderful weekend.